Welcome, cinephiles, to another episode of Frame by Frame, a series dedicated to the craft of filmmaking. Now, today we're going to talk about film adaptions. How do you put a book, a television series, or a graphic novel on screen? What do you leave in? And, more importantly, what do you leave out? Well, to answer that question, let me introduce you to my friend Tim. He's a filmmaker and student, like many of you, and he's going to give us his thoughts on what makes for a good film adaption, using Batman as a case study. Which I guess makes this an adaption of Frame by Frame on adaption, but I'll stop rambling. Thanks Kyle, and hi everyone. There are few characters for whom there is a more diverse selection of adaptations than Batman. At times, it's hard to believe that Joel Schumacher created a movie based on the same character as Christopher Nolan. So for the purposes of this analysis, I'm going to do exactly that. Let's compare what is largely revered as Batman's worst ever interpretation with Batman's most successful iteration to date. And here we go. Let's focus on how audiences reacted to both films and figure out what makes Batman, Batman. Why is The Dark Knight considered a good interpretation while Batman and Robin isn't? I want a car. Chicks dig the car. And what does that say about how adapting source material works in general? When do audiences reject the adaptation because it strays too far away from the character they've come to know and love? With any iconic character, there are certain images, lines, or music we expect to see in any adaptation. It's often the most basic, superficial stuff the audience at large associates with the character. Think about the gun barrel in James Bond, or the line, Bond James Bond. Who are you? Bond. James Bond. Think about the opening title scroll from Star Wars or the fuse lighting in every Mission Impossible film. Audiences expect to see these things in almost any adaptation of that source material. So, what are these superficial elements for Batman? Well, Batman has a huge list of iconography that audiences expect to see. From the bat signal, to the costume, to the Batmobile, you show any given person any of these images and they'll know exactly what it's from. The Dark Knight, though not as theatrical as the Burton films, uses Batman imagery very effectively. From Batman silhouetted standing on the edge of buildings to gliding through the city, we get our fair share of iconic Batman imagery. Though the images were updated to give off a gritty modern look, Nolan still hits each major pop cultural piece of Batman iconography over the course of his trilogy. An updated version of the Bat Signal, a military tank rendition of the Batmobile. Despite the realistic take, we still get the iconic costume, the grappling hook, and the gadgets. We get a fancy explanation for how his cape works, but ultimately it brings us to what we expect to see. Batman doing one of his signature moves. It's definitely been toned down, but it's all there. And the most impressive thing is that it's been naturally incorporated into the story. So, what did Batman and Robin get wrong here? Hi Freeze, I'm Batman. Well, they didn't miss anything, that's for sure. We pretty much see all these major Batman elements. The costume, the car, the signal, the gadgets. The problem lies in that all the things that we love about the character have been bastardized in some way. Sure, we get the costume, but it has nipples on it for some reason. Perfect pecs, so why not include the nipple as part of it? I had no idea that I would um, actually become famous for being the person who put nipples on the bat suit. Yeah, we get the gadgets, grappling hook, bat bombs, but then we get unnecessary things like the bat laser ice melty thing and the infamously despised bat credit card. Seven million. <laughs> The redesigned Batmobile looks like a toy, and there are even unnecessary costume changes and additional vehicles included for the purposes of selling toys. It's not even speculation, they say it in the goddamn movie. I'm a lover, not a fighter. That's why every Poison Ivy action figure comes complete with him! We basically get all the stuff we expect, yet every time there is something off about it. It's cynical, it's like the filmmakers are bashing us over the head saying, You love Batman, don't you? Don't you? In a way, George Clooney's delivery of the iconic I'm Batman line sums it up best. I freeze, I'm Batman. Just because you say the words, doesn't mean it works. I'm Batman. Then there's the character work. Batman is driven by the death of his parents. This is an element that hasn't been changed in any interpretation. Unlike his more optimistic peers, Batman doesn't take much joy in what he does, and the most successful on-screen adaptations of the character focus on Bruce Wayne as a tortured and complex individual. Some consider Michael Keaton to be their favorite Bruce Wayne, but one of the elements Batman purists disliked about Tim Burton's original film was the change to Batman's origin story. In the 1989 film, Bruce's parents were murdered by the Joker, which was a departure from the origin story told in the comics. The Nolan version rectified this and created arguably the most faithful film adaptation of Batman's origin to date. 
Though Nolan's trilogy is occasionally criticized for having its title character be less interesting than his villains, Bruce Wayne in the Dark Knight trilogy is a complicated character, clearly haunted by his parents' death and driven to strike fear into the hearts of Gotham's criminals. We spend a lot of time setting up his journey in Batman Begins, and in the Dark Knight we get a real sense of Bruce's desire to hang up the cape. He carries this burden and pushes himself physically to match people like the Joker because he believes it's the only way to stop them. Know your limits, Master Wayne. Batman has no limits. When you think about it, Batman and Robin had all the pieces to have an interesting character journey for Clooney's Bruce Wayne. On paper, I'd probably greenlight this movie if I were an executive at Warner Brothers. Bruce Wayne and Mr. Freeze both face losing a loved one. Bruce faces losing Alfred and Mr. Freeze faces losing his wife. Both men are doing all they can, but they go about it in different ways. As an ideological conflict between your lead characters, that's not bad. But none of this plays out dramatically on screen. When Alfred says, Perhaps the truth is you really don't trust anyone. It simply doesn't ring true based on Bruce's actions. He seems to have a girlfriend, a partner, and Bruce even suggests Barbara, later to be Batgirl, should stay over at the house. Wouldn't he be opposed to this idea if he truly had trust issues? But the problem is far larger than this. Try and describe George Clooney's Bruce Wayne. It's hard, isn't it? He's reduced to nothing more than a babysitter for two stubborn teenagers. The romance doesn't hit home because Julie exists merely to serve the Poison Ivy storyline. Speaking of the Poison Ivy story... Hey there, pretty birdie. It completely reduces Batman and Robin's dynamic to having them fight over a girl. Well, I'm totally over, alright? Positively. Me too, definitely. Great stems, though. Buds, too. Yeah, those are nice. I mean, seriously? And if the arc is about Bruce learning to trust Robin, didn't he kind of do that already? Wasn't that the journey of Batman Forever, the previous Joel Schumacher Batman installment? But in short, George Clooney's Bruce Wayne in almost zero ways feels like the character we've come to know and love. This is probably the biggest issue with the film. I know it's easy to point to rocket ships, surfboarding through the sky, back credit cards, melting ice by redirecting sunlight from the other side of the equator, but the real sin in this movie is that it doesn't even portray its main character correctly. I found the Batcave. We gotta get those locks changed. She knows who we are. Guess we'll just have to kill her. Yep, we'll kill her later. We have work to do. The Batman mythos is home to some of the most iconic villains in comic book history. And what's a good hero without a good villain? So let's compare how the Nolan films largely got this right, while the Schumacher films missed the mark. Louder, come on, sing, 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 come on. Yes, come on, louder. As I mentioned earlier, one of the major criticisms of Nolan's Batman films is that the villains are more interesting than our lead character. Enough from the clown. Let's not blow this out of proportion. I'd argue this is because Nolan as a director has a tendency to focus on ideas rather than characters. It's about plot and grand themes. The villains in Christopher Nolan films aren't just villains, they represent something larger. The Joker represents chaos, while Batman represents order. It's a story about a man who meets his ideological opposite, and how in many ways these two extremes are closer than you'd ever think. This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. Similarly, Harvey Dent functions as an example of how good men can be corrupted, and how the symbol of Batman is an incorruptible force in this equation. For a commercial blockbuster, it's complicated, layered stuff. Meanwhile, another element that unites people in their hatred for Batman and Robin are the terrible cartoony villains. His name is Bane. A laundry service that delivers. Wow. Again, there is such mispotential for a story about two men who stand to lose someone they love and go about saving their partners in different ways. This whole film could have thematically been about family and loss. Instead, Free seems to exist so the writers can have an ice pun writing competition. All right, everyone, chill. Want to do something bold and different? Sure, go ahead, the Nolan version tried new things. Bond is constantly reinventing itself, but when it feels like a cynical cash grab designed by a boardroom to exploit the iconography for all it's worth, well, you turn people off. The audience can sense that none of the elements in Batman and Robin are there for creative reasons. So why does The Dark Knight succeed as an adaptation while Batman and Robin fails? Well, because Nolan took the trademark elements of the characters and reinvented them while staying true to the essence of Batman's story. To me, Bruce Wayne works best when he's portrayed as a psychologically tormented millionaire battling his inner demons as much as eccentric sociopathic bad guys. I want to see the gadgets and all that fun stuff, but to me, nailing Batman's tormented character is key. 
Now looking forwards towards Batman and Superman, I'm curious to see what Zack Snyder's take will be. I'd say if there's one thing I'm confident about, it will be his ability to replicate the iconography in visually interesting ways. In fact, I like this shot from the first trailer where Bruce is looking at the suit and he seems scared of it, scared of what he becomes when he puts it on. That shot of the bat branded into the criminal is great because I feel like we haven't seen mean Batman yet, which is a popular iteration in various comics and graphic novels. I just hope the whole thing isn't too crowded and we get to spend enough time with each character. So now I ask you, what makes Batman Batman? What forms the foundation of Batman's character and what are the trademark elements necessary for any Batman adaptation? Thanks, Tim. And speaking of Batman vs. Superman, we should talk about next month's Loot Crate. The theme, Versus. Showcasing classic matchups like Daredevil vs. Punisher or The Dark Knight vs. The Man of Steel. But the real winner of these rivalries could be you. You see, Loot Crate is a subscription service that delivers a Loot Crate like this one to your house every month. Inside each crate is a variety of pop culture collectibles, apparel, you name it. Better yet, all crates contain a $40 value for less than $20 a month. All you need to do is sign up by the March 19th cutoff at 9 p.m. Pacific to get your loot. So if you'd like to join, follow the URL on screen and enter the code FRAME to save 10% on your subscription. A savings you can always put towards the Gotham City Reconstruction Fund, because trust me, they're gonna need it. Thank you for watching ladies and gentlemen and make sure to subscribe to this channel Film Theory for more fantastic film related content. And if you want to check out more of Tim's work, click on the frame to the left to see his hilarious sketch Telekinetic Girlfriend. Or if you just want to see more of his super creative short films, follow the link in the description box below to his channel. And you can click the frame to the right to check out a Film Theory episode on Deadpool. And until next time, my name is Kyle and this has been Frame by Frame.